I'd like to introduce Mike Montgomery, who is our chosen investment management partner here at Line Financial, and um, we've got a few questions that we would like to put to him today, uh, and uh, hopefully you find the answers helpful. So, Mike, um, I think there's no hiding from the fact that you know everyone in in this sector has been through a. A uh, turbulent time over the last two, three years for various world events. Mm -hmm. um, we as a firm feel cautiously optimistic for what lies ahead of us. Do you share that same mindset? Yes, I do. Can uh, you explain why we may be sharing that mindset? I'll do my best. Uh, well, if I think back to the start of my, my career investing monies, um, it was before the great financial crash, so 2007 and then 2009, you know, RBS shares were at 10p in, in March and folk were queuing up uh, outside Northern Rock shortly before that. And there's always been things that come along that get investors nervous uh, and, and rattle markets. But I think, you know, if coming back to that historical backset, if you take a long-term view, equity markets always outperform all other asset classes and the historical back test for that is, is huge. Where we're at at the moment is we've just been through a period where inflation is back at levels that we've not seen since, you know, possibly the 1970s uh, for a short period of time. Interest rates are moving back to levels that we've not seen since before the great financial crash. So markets are going through a kind of dislocation, in addition to which there's some geopolitical issues, particularly at, at the moment that we're seeing. But I think if you were to focus on the negatives, you would never have money in the, in the market. And you would have missed out potentially on huge returns, particularly for investors that have been in for a long time. And where, where we're at at the moment is, we've been through a bad period. If you've managed to ride out that storm in markets and still have money invested, stay the course because potentially you could be missing out on some really nice returns, not just in equity markets, but in bond markets as well, as interest rates start to reverse pathway. So we're quite confident in that respect, but also companies are still making you know, reasonable profits. And we do have technological advancements, which potentially could be game changers for lots of businesses. You know, if you think of artificial intelligence and, you know, the, the way that can improve the way that businesses do business. So we think that there's a, a bull case, you know, there's a positive case. Um, and don't, don't get too nervous about the short term and, and the news flow that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, so I would definitely agree with that. So, Mike, how will the future elections in both the UK and the US, US affect markets going forward? Yeah, I mean, certainly they'll have an impact. Um, if you look at the timelines of when these events are going to occur, the, the UK election isn't a matter of certainty. You know, Rishi Sunak could go as soon as next spring, for example, if he wanted to. And indeed, um, some of the kind of rolling back on the green policies that were in place suggests that they're, they're building towards an election. But where we stand at the moment is the bookies, if you, if you place some store on, on how they price up the outcomes, certainly you're looking at a Labour government uh, between 80 and 90% probability as it stands at the moment. And traditionally that's viewed as, as bad for the markets, but there's actually no empirical evidence uh, to support that, or if there is, it's debatable. So we're not overly concerned about the, the, the UK market. Certainly at the moment it looks like Labour, and if the market expects that, you know, it's priced into, into prices already. The US, the US election is a bit different and it's really finely poised as it always is, as you know. Um, Bookie's odds have got a kind of neck and neck 50-50 between the Democrats and, and Republicans. And believe it or not, Donald Trump is favourite to be the next US president. So there's going to be a few twists and turns there and certainly a bit of uncertainty. But again, you know, the the traditional thought is the Republicans are good for markets because they're low regulation, theoretically low tax, and markets should perform better accordingly. But it doesn't always 
doesn't always work like that. You know, the Democrats, if you think about it, the big public spending programmes, big spending on infrastructure, that can be positive for markets as well. So at the moment, it's not front and centre for us. Certainly of more importance to markets is really the path for inflation and interest rates. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's what's really going to drive returns over the next 18 months or so. Okay. How long do you think it will take for interest rates to begin to fall on the UK? So uh, that's the question on a lot of our minds and certainly if you can predict not just in the UK but global interest rates, particularly the US and the pathway for them, uh, you're going to have a great chance of outperforming markets generally. Our view is that we might have another couple of interest rate rises this year um, but Aside from that, we're in line with consensus and consensus expectation is that next year we will see a gradual easing of interest rates, both in the US and the UK. The UK. So 4.5% in the middle of 2024, I think, is realistic. That's, that's where we're at. Um, in the US, you know, they, they look a bit further out. So the Federal Reserve have 12 members of the board, effectively, that vote on interest rates. And they're expected to publicly declare what their um, projections are for interest rates. And they are saying 2025 is when they could see interest rates getting back to that kind of 2.5%. So next year, in summary, it'll begin to ease and then potentially 2025 before we see some cuts. So onto a downward trend next year? We hope, yes. Okay. So Mike, where do you see equity markets being in the next three to five years? Difficult question, um, crystal ball type stuff, especially over that kind of, sh well, we would regard it as a short and medium term time scale. But, you know, we've got a great historical back set now in terms of data around stock markets in the US. We can go back over 100 years and the long term analysis suggests that stock markets in the US deliver circa 10% annualised. I think it would be a bit optimistic to to believe that we could we could deliver that over the next three to five years, but certainly seven and a half, eight percent, I do think is realistic. Uh, the reasons why are we, we've gone through a period where inflation has been high, interest rates have had to had to go up, and that's not conducive to, to stock market returns. And if we go into an environment where those those headwinds ease um, and central banks are able to reduce or hold rates we could be going into an environment that really is quite nice for stock markets and for bond markets. Yeah. So you would think that the prospect of a bull market is reasonable to predict? I would say so. I mean, we're actually in the foothills of a bull market at the moment, believe it or not. Um, so we're going back to kind of October 2022 for the, for the last low. Um, you know, and if... As I was saying, if inflation does ease and interest rates, you know, don't keep going up, uh, we could have a backdrop which is really quite nice. In addition to which, you know, we've got some factors out there that are supportive of markets in terms of companies are still generating good profits. We have this story uh, around artificial intelligence, which is potentially a game changer for lots of businesses and could drive further increases in pro profitability. And, you know, that's that's supportive for, for stock markets, you know, if, if, if you can hold on for three or five years, certainly. Okay. What are your views on the Indian equity market at this moment in time? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. So we are big proponents of emerging markets. Um, they haven't delivered great returns, if we're looking back on a kind of 18 month uh, time, time frame, but certainly the emerging market story is still there. You know, if you look at the demographics in the developed world versus the emerging world, younger workforce, uh, driving economic growth and profitability of, of, of businesses. And when you, when you look at the emerging market universe as a whole, there's a lot of variety there. Now, India is probably one of the most attractive emerging markets. Why? because their workforce is particularly young. I think the average age is around about 28, which globally is, is, is young. Um, they also have uh, changed their approach to corporate governance. It's improving. So that's another tailwind for, for, for their stock market. But what I would say is that the valuations there already reflect that positive story. So if you look at 
we, we look at price earnings ratios, how, how much do you pay for the earnings of the companies in, in that type of country. So to kind of put some context around it, um, the price earnings ratio for Russia has a six, you know, so you're paying six times for the profits of, of Russian companies. Um, whereas in India you're paying around about 14 times. So it's an expensive market already, but we do recognise that there's a positive story there. And we do have some exposure in the portfolio. So both the Asian fund that we select and the emerging market fund are overweight Indian equities. So we do get some kind of exposure to, to that market. Okay, thank you. So Mike, what area of the market do you see as being the most undervalued at this moment in time? Yeah, so this is something our, our strategists look at regularly and guide us as investment managers. And there's two aspects there. One is uh, industrial sectors, but also geographic uh, locales. So we've already talked about India being an expensive um, market relative to other emerging markets. But funnily enough, the UK market, when you look on price earnings ratios, is relatively cheap. But the businesses that we have here aren't massively exciting you know we don't have the te technology mega cap growth stocks that, that perhaps the US does um, but yeah the UK on a, on a long term basis there's some great, great yielding companies in, in the UK um, and you could get some good returns here industrial sector wise um, technology certainly is expensive still expensive and that's to do with this artificial intelligence uh, story that's circulating at the moment and driving returns, particularly in the in, in the US. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, cheap sectors. If you look at commercial property, for example, I'm not sure I would advocate ad allocating money there wholesale at the moment. But if you look at something like land securities, uh, which is a, a property investment trust, effectively. Uh, they own the Trafford Centre in Manchester, Blue Water Shopping Centre. I don't know if you've got clients that enjoy retail experiences, but those uh, uh, that particular prop, prop co property company, the value of the assets that is hold and the price that it trades on, on, on the market is trading at a 33% discount. So if you're looking for bargains, that's maybe the kind of sector that you, that you could look at. And certainly the dividend yield on that particular investment, around about 6%, which is, which is quite attractive just to buy and hold and pick up the dividend income. Okay, thank you.